Can someone who's online confirm that they can hear me? I heard all about the jury duty. <laughs> Good. We have fewer technical problems today than last time. And we'll start right at 10 after for those who are waiting online. And by the way, I can't see the chat um, while I have my computer in presenter mode. So if you're online, just shout if you want to ask a question. I found that admitting what I really do for a living eliminated me from jury duty, just talking about my profession. <laughs> really? And I was on a case of a guy who picked up a huge flagstone and unfortunately killed a tourist from Texas. And the accused was in the room. And I was trying to stay on the jury duty. Don't ask me why. <laughs> So I lied and I said I taught school or I said something that sounded true but wasn't. <clears throat> and then he began to really focus on me, like staring at me. So then I clarified what I do for a living and they eliminated me. <laughs> I have not been called back since that incident. I don't know what they put in my file. They put you in the blacklist. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. They control the time by freezing. Yeah. All right, so we'll get started. If you recall where we left off 24 hours ago, the, we worked out that the spin magnetization processes around the instantaneous magnetic field. And then we ended by saying, of course, there had to be some relaxation processes that would restore Boltzmann equilibrium. And then in the very early days, blocks, uh, there would be two processes, a process that restored longitudinal magnetization to Boltzmann equilibrium, and that's what called P1 or R1, and then a second process that would dephase transverse magnetization, and that's what we call T2 or R2. And for a while in the course, we'll just use these phenomenological rate constants and talk about T1 processes that restore Boltzmann equilibrium and transverse relaxation rate processes that dephase any transverse magnetization. Of course, different types of longitudinal magnetization may have different T1s, different types of transverse magnetization will have different T2s. And eventually when we get to relaxation theory, we'll spend a lot of time trying to figure out why that is in developing the theory that 
than is predictive for the relaxation times or relaxation rates. But for a while, we can just make lots of progress by saying there is some T1 and there is some T2 associated with some magnetization. And then it turns out to be surprisingly simple because not so simple for advancement of slides. Um, to add then relaxation in to the precession equations. So now we just say that the X magnetization precesses and it dephases. So we just need to know the X component of the cross product. And we go look that up in physics book. And that leads to then this differential equation for the X magnetization. There's the part that comes from precession and the part from relaxation. And similarly, Y magnetization, we just need to know the Y component of the cross product. And we add in the damping term, the dephasing term, and we get this. And similarly, the Z magnetization, we need to know the Z component of the magnetic of the cross product. And then we add in the damping or the relaxation recovery at Boltzmann equilibrium. So M naught here means Boltzmann equilibrium. So relaxation, our one relaxation will always drive the system towards Boltzmann equilibrium. Transverse magnetization, there is none at Boltzmann equilibrium. So there's no other term here. That would be MY minus zero. So And then, of course, you see um, right away, for example, if we don't have any transverse magnetic field, i.e., if we just have the B naught field, this term is zero and Z magnetization just relaxes. There's no precession of Z magnetization around the B naught field. And similarly, for X and Y magnetization, if there's no transverse field, then the only time dependence comes from recession around the B-naught field and then decaying away. Most of the time we're going to work with these equations in the rotating frame. They want to shift into the rotating frame and instead of having, for example, the B-naught field, we have the scaled B naught field. And if we think of everything in frequency units, then we have the frequency offset capital omega and the transverse fields become time independent because we're in the rotating frame, rotating with the transverse field. So the transverse fields just have an amplitude and a phase. So if we have an X phase, for example, this term would be zero, this term would be zero, and we would just have minus omega one and omega one. Or if we had a Y field, this would be omega one minus omega one, these two terms would be zero. But of course, on a modern spectrometer, we can apply any phase transverse RF field we want. Um, anyhow, we can either write these as differential equations, but more commonly you'll see that I write them in a matrix form, because then it's very easy to put the matrix form into a computer program like Python or Mathematica and get a numerical solution to this, to this equation. It's a three by three matrix. So in principle, there's an analytic solution, but people tend not to write it down because it's kind of messy. There's two limits though. One would be that we don't have the transverse field. We just have the B naught field. And that of course I'll always call free precession. And here are, here's the equation. And then we can just ask, ask Mathematica now for solutions. These solutions now are simple because Really, we have a two by two matrix and a one by one matrix. 
and they're independent of each other. They're not coupled together by the omega one. So we can solve the two by two matrix separately from the one by one. And here are the solutions. So X magnetization is just processing. So X magnetization is turning into Y magnetization under the rotation around the V-naught field. Y magnetization is turning into X magnetization and everything is decaying away. And then Z magnetization is just relaxing towards the spin equilibrium. And shown here, this is just the previous equation written slightly different. So for, yeah? Ah, yes. So M parentheses zero here means the state of the magnetization at time zero. So that may, might mean, for example, right after a 90 degree pulse. And if we had a Y phase RF pulse, then we would generate at time zero MX magnetization. And M sub zero, I mean Boltzmann equilibrium. And so that's Z magnetization at Boltzmann equilibrium. And of course, I won't be completely consistent. Sometimes I'll say M sub EQ when I mean Boltzmann uh, magnetization. And then the other limit that there are easy analytic solutions to is if we have a pulse that's short so that we can ignore relaxation during the pulse. And in that case, the block equations reduce to this. We have the pulse, the RF field, but now um, there's no relaxation. In general, R2 is going to be the largest relaxation rate, larger than R1. So T2 is going to be the shortest relaxation time. So these equations would apply if the pulse is turned on for a time short compared to T2. And on a, you know, in solution, a 90, say a 90 degree pulse on the hydrogens is about 10 microseconds. And the relaxation rate for the size proteins or RNA that you're normally working on are going to be tens of milliseconds. So the 90 degree pulse is much shorter than T2. But if instead you're doing, say, a taxi experiment where you would have the RF field turned on for maybe 60 milliseconds or longer, then generally you're not in that regime anymore where relaxation could be ignored. Now, turns out one may ignore relaxation anyhow, but it's at least not justifiable in this limit. Now, a good thing about either of these two equations, actually go backwards, is this equation, this two by two block, just describes rotation in the transverse plane around the B naught, around the Z axis. And these equations, if we either have a phase of zero, these describe just rotation around the x-axis. And if we have phi of pi over two, they just describe rotation around the y-axis. So those are three very simple cases. And you can see them pictorially here. Here are the equations the matrix equations describe the rotation. That's just taken from the previous one, but it's easier to just think pictorially. So here I have a B1 field with X phase, phi equal to zero. Then I describe rotation by putting my thumb 
along the x-axis. My fingers are the initial magnetization. And then I just rotate in a right-handed sense. So, so as shown there, if I start with Z magnetization, it's going to rotate towards the minus Y axis, and then the minus Z axis, and then the Y axis, and then back up to Z. Whereas if I add line magnetization, Z magnetization rotates first towards X, and then minus Z, minus X, back to Z. And Z magnetization, X rotates towards Y, and then to minus X. So this right-handed convention is going to get used over and over and over again. So you want to look at this picture and make sure you can do these rotations with hands. It also means then there's a very simple trigonomic relationship. And, um, for some reason, that's missing. So now I have to try to see if I can use the board for the first time. This will be practice. So, so transparent. Fortunately. Now people online can see the screen. Yes. I'll try to write big pictures. So first off, if you're not used to it, then the ordinate system that we use is right-handed, and that means if I put my thumb along Z, my fingers along X, the rotation should go to plus Y. If I do it backwards, if I have to slot X and Y, then if I rotate X, it's going to go to minus Y, and that's a left hand ordinate system. So the first thing is, whenever you draw one of these pictures, it should be right-handed. Thumb on Z, Fingers on X, rotate towards plus Y. And now if I am at some rotation, so let's suppose so green, let's say, is my initial magnetization on the Z axis. And now I'm going to, let's say, do a, a Y rotation. My thumbs on Y, the magnetization will start to rotate towards X. And let's imagine that I've applied some pulse that has an odd resonance rotation angle of theta. So the magnetization then ends up after the pulse, making an angle theta. And now I want to know how much magnetization is in the transverse plane, and how much magnetization is left on the starting axis. So of course, that's a call for little, little trigonometry. That's how much ends up on the remaining on the starting axis, and then the picture is down here is how much ends up there. And a few seconds of recall can then tell you that the amount that's left behind goes as the cosine of theta. And then the amount that ends up on the new axis will go as the sine of theta. So, of course, as theta is zero, you don't get any magnetization on the new axis, it's all on the old axis. And what, if you're just if you're doing everything mathematically, you have to be careful about signs. But the nice thing about 
keeping track of the rotation with your fingers is you can't get the sign on. So here, I have my fingers on Y, I rotate from Z, and I see that I'm rotating towards the plus axis. So I know that this will be a plus sign beta, not minus sign beta. So the magnetization that's left behind is always cosine beta, but the destination magnetization might be plus sine beta or minus sine beta, depending on the rotation. And since I can't keep track of that algebraically so easy, it's easy for me to keep track of it using the hand. So for example, an X rotation would be rotating towards Z magnetization towards minus Y, and I would end up with a minus sign beta. So you want to make sure you get quite comfortable keeping track of the signs of the rotation. And the same thing would happen, of course, we were talking about rotation around Z. I just put my thumb along the Z axis, and then I have a starting axis and the finishing axis. So the Cartesian rotations are easy because we can always play this trick of doing the handed rotations. Of course, not all rotations in practice are Cartesian rotations. And in particular, when we start to talk about resonance offset, then this won't be the case. So here, for example, is the picture you already saw that if we're not on resonance, then the effective field doesn't point along one of the Cartesian axes. And the precession then will be around some tilted cone, not around the Cartesian axis. It's still the case that the rotation angle is the magnetic field amplitude times the time. But where we end up is more complicated. And here may be out of order is the picture I meant to show you. Again, the rotation around Y, we have cosine of beta left on the Z axis, sine of beta, the magnetization on the X axis. So that's the same picture here, it's somehow got out of it. And if we wanted to do this algebraically, we have our starting magnetization, in this case, magnetization on the Z axis. So I represent the starting magnetization as a vector. Here's the X component of the vector, the Y component of the vector, the Z component of the vector. Here's the rotation matrix for a Y rotation. And if I do the, multi the matrix multiplication, I find out I end up with a sine, sine beta projection on the plus x axis and the cosine beta projection back onto the z axis. And of course, I can put in any vector there for arbitrary magnetization calculation. Now, if I'm off resonance and I'm in the tilted frame, of course, I could give up and just do a numerical calculation and ask Mathematica or, or Python just to do the calculation and tell me the answer. There's a trick, though, um, that I'll just show you here just so you know it. And it's easiest to understand the trick if you ever played with Rubik's cubes when in your life. So if anybody a master of the Rubik's Cube. So actually the Rubik's Cube was invented to teach this concept. And it was only later it was a game. It was invented by a mathematician to teach aspects of group theory. And then it was realized you could make a lot more money selling it as a game. But the trick in solving the Rubik's Cube is people learn particular patterns 
for example, where they could swap two corner pieces. And then if you need to swap two edge pieces, you have to move them to the corners, do your swap by the algorithm you know, and then undo what you did to bring them to the corners. And that's how a lot of NMR works, that we have some solution we know and we want to, so suppose I know how to trick, I know how to rotate magnetization around Z in my picture here. My effective field isn't on Z. If the effective field was on Z, I know what to do. I just rotate around Z. So the Rubik cubes trick is I do some rotation to get the effective field on Z and that rotates my magnetization somewhere. Then I rotate around Z, rotating the magnetization, and then I undo whatever I did to get the effective field out of the Z axis. And just like in the Rubik's cube, that's guaranteed to work. It turns out it's not the most efficient way to do things, but it's a conceptually simple way. And that's what this says. So for some, arbitrary field, so arbitrary tilt angle, arbitrary phase, the first thing I should do is rotate around Z to get rid of the phase, to bring the, mag the phase back to the X axis. And now the second thing I should do is undo the tilt angle, rotate the effective field back to the Z axis, both of these move my magnetization somewhere else in space. But now I can rotate around Z with the angle alpha, that was the effective field times the pulse length, and then undo what I did. Rotate back to the original tilt angle, rotate back to the original phase. And if you count then in general, I have one, two, three, four, five Cartesian rotations. And that's not a, you know, that's not the minimum number of steps. I working with things called Euler angles that Anne will eventually introduce. You only need three rotations, um, but you have to calculate the Euler angles. Here we don't have to calculate the Euler angles, and with five rotations, then we can calculate an arbitrary pulse. And we know these angles, we know these rotation matrices. These are the X, Y, and Z rotations. And if we multiply them all together, for example, here's the result of this X phase pulse. So I simplified to the phase um, being equal to zero. Here's the result of an arbitrary X phase pulse applied to some starting magnification. And you can see it depends on both the tilt angle and the magnitude of the effective field for the, the net rotation. And of course, there's now dozens of programs that will do this kind of calculation for you. And here's a picture of just what it is we need to do. So given some arbitrary mega field, we first have to rotate back to the x-axis, and if I'm starting at Z magnetization, that rotation around Z doesn't affect the Z magnetization. And then um, once I'm in the X-Z plane, I need to rotate around the Y-axis to bring the effective field to the Z-axis. And that, of course, rotates the Z magnetization off to some new position. And then I have to rotate around the z-axis by the rotation angle alpha that's shown here. And then I have to rotate again around the y-axis back to the original tilt angle. And then once I'm at the original tilt angle, I have to rotate by the phase back to the original phase. And those are the five rotations, and then the magnetization ends up somewhere in space. If I was doing this by hand, at each step, because I only know how to do the Cartesian rotations, at each step, 
I have to decompose the red vector, the magnetization vector, into its x, y, and z components and rotate each component around y or z. And of course, this is painful to do by hand, but a computer doesn't care. Right? This program will follow these rotations, and the computer is happy to do, do them for me. If I have some complicated waveform, some time varying mega one field or time varying resonance offset, then I have to divide the problem into small pieces where each piece is short enough in time so I can treat the affected field as constant in that short time interval, do this calculation, change to the next effective field, redo the calculation, and iterate my way through. Again, I don't want to do that by hand, but I can take any profile and turn it into steps of a fraction of a microsecond and iterate my way through. So here's... Uh, the first important picture, probably. So now I've done the calculation as a function of resonance offset. So for some omega-1, remember gamma times B1 is the, well, it should be some absolute value signs there, would be the magnitude of B1 field, and omega is the offset. And I, for the solid line here, adjusted the omega-1 field and the length of the pulse to get a 90-degree rotation off resonance. And now here, the black line shows so amplitude here of 1 means all the magnetization is on, let's say, the x-axis. And as I start to move off resonance, you can see Initially, the amplitude of the magnetization doesn't change very much. So I'm still getting almost all the magnetization into the transverse plane. The remaining magnetization is still on the z-axis. But you can see eventually the magnetization that's left in the transverse plane goes to zero. So where's the magnetization? There's no transverse magnetization. So where is the magnetization? It's back on Z. And what's happened is, so on resonance, there's a 90 degree rotation. If you look here at this picture, as we go off resonance, the effective field is the vector sum of the omega-1 field and the offset. As we go off resonance, the effective field is always larger than the omega-1 field. The time is fixed. That's the pulse length. So as we go off resonance alpha, the rotation angle is always larger than the on-resonance rotation angle. So I adjusted things on resonance to be pi over two rotation. As I go off resonance, the rotation angle will always be greater than 90 degrees. And when I get to the rotation angle being pi over two, when alpha is pi over two, the magnetization will have processed around the tilted cone and come right back to the plus Z axis. So that's what you see here. And in this picture, the magnetization has rotated by pi over two off resonance, comes back to where we started. So it looks like I did nothing. But in fact, I've done a two pi rotation around the tilted frame. And this, in fact, is the simplest kind of selective pulse. If I arrange, the B1 field, the omega-1 field, such that 
the spins I'm interested in rotating by 90 degrees are on resonance, and the spins that I want to leave looking like I didn't excite them, that they're still on the Z axis, I arrange such that at that particular offset, they will have undergone a two pi rotation. Then it looks like I did a selective ex excitation of the on resonance spins. And in proteins, this is the simplest way of separating, say, the C alphas from the carbonyls. You put the carrier in the middle of the C alpha position and adjust the V1 field so that a 90 degree rotation for the C alphas looks like a two pi rotation for the, for the carbonyls. And fortunately, the C alphas are a relatively narrow spectral region and the carbonyls are a pretty narrow spectral region. So that works approximately well. Here you can see though, the, here's the phase there for that 90 degree pulse. Oh, here's the rotation angle. So you can see that the rotation angle starts at 90 degrees and eventually hits 360 degrees or a two pi rotation. And here's the phase error for the magnetization that ends up in the transverse plane. So initially, I've adjusted things. So I get a rotation, say, right to the x axis. There's no phase error. And as I start to move off resonance, initially, here, as we said, the amplitude doesn't decay very much, but I start to see a phase error because during the pulse, the magnetization is starting to process. And the phase error, you can see, gets larger and larger. As shown here, eventually, of course, we hit this null, there's no magnetization. But a very nice thing about the 90 degree pulse is the phase error is pretty close to linear, at least out to omega over omega one equal to one. So out to about the field strength, an offset equal to roughly the RF field strength, the phase there is close to linear. And that means you can correct for the phase there during the pulse by the first order phase correction, frequency dependent phase correction. And that's why doing 90 degree pulse acquire is such an easy experiment because the phase error is easily corrected by a linear first order phase correction. So within this region, within the offset going from zero to about a relative offset of one, a 90 degree pulse is pretty close to ideal except for a phase error first order phaser. But here the dashed line is 180 degree pulse. And you can see 180 degree pulse has horrible performance. As soon as you start to go, we want to invert magnetization, but we start with Z, 180 degree pulse should invert magnetization. If we're on resonance, that's great, but you can see the performance decays away very quickly as you go off resonance. And again, there are nulls, which are where you've done a two pi rotation instead of a 180 degree rotation. And again, we can make use of those nulls to get selective inversions. But in between nulls and non resonance, right, performance is really bad. And that means when you look at modern pulse sequences, most of the time, the 90 degree pulses are 90 degree pulses, but the 180 degree pulses, especially at high field, are quite commonly something other than just a pulse of twice the length of the 90s. They might be composite pulses, of some kind of pulse sandwich. They might be an adiabatic pulse. They might be now some kind of optimal control theory pulse. That it doesn't look like anything at all. It's just some waveform. And that's because they're all designed to get around this horrible performance of a simple square 180 degree pulse, where in, until you get to 
maybe 900 megahertz or 1.2 gig, 1.2 gigahertz on a solution code, people don't spend much time trying to optimize a 90 degree pulse because they work so well, except for the space correction. So we have, by the way, our pulse sandwich, and we don't want to maybe belabor the point too much. Um, But one important thing is the rotations don't commute with each other. And you probably learned that in physics class, doing a, applying a Y rotation to magnetization followed by an X rotation gives a different result than applying an X rotation followed by the Y rotation. So here, the Y rotation applied to Z magnetization puts the magnetization, we do our picture, so I just do it without the map our picture. So if we apply a pi over two rotation, Um, so here's the so here well ninety degree y rotation ninety degree x rotation I multiply these two together and then multiply them by the starting magnetization. And this says the result of applying this sandwich to Z magnetization gives X magnetization. But if we did it with our hands, we would say we start with Z magnetization. Our fingers are along the Y axis. We rotate, then the 90 degree pulse puts the magnetization on X. And then our second pulse is our fingers are on X, the magnetization is on X, so nothing happens when we rotate. Both vectors are in the same direction, so we end up with plus X magnetization as shown here. In contrast, if we start with the X rotation, our fingers are on X, we rotate to minus Y, now, we have a Y rotation, but that doesn't do anything to Y magnetization, and we end up with minus Y magnetization. The slide isn't so helpful because I, I multiplied the two rotations together, which is kind of how a computer would do it. Easier if I'd done it two steps. But the main point is that order matters when we do rotations, and we have to keep that in mind, and you'll already notice here in these sandwiches, I have the starting magnetization here, then the first rotation, the second rotation. So relative to English, things are going backwards. I write first rotation on the right, second rotation on the left, so on and so forth. However, if rotations are infinitesimal, very small rotations, then they do commute. And that's shown here. I put in the rotation angles now for a Y rotation by an angle alpha, beta rotation by an angle beta. So I multiply everything out Here's the result, and if the angles 
are small, the sine of the angle is the angle, sine of beta is beta, cosine of zero at in infinitesimal angle is one. So I get this, and now I do things in the other order. The result, the true result is different, of course, between the two. But if I go to the limit where the angles are small, then I get the same result. So infinitesimal rotations will commute, and that turns out to be important in certain kinds of calculations. But in general, rotations don't commute. Now, these days, as you'll see in, in the literature and some examples, one does designs new pulses by computer simulation. One doesn't sit down by hand anymore and work out the results of sandwiches and pulses. But before there were powerful enough computers, this was done by hand and intuition. So if we wanted to calculate the effect of some series of pulses in the presence of resonance offset, for example, each pulse, we would have this sandwich of five rotations. And then that would be repeated for each pulse in the series. And here are some examples from you know, the really historic literature that really started with Malcolm Levitt and Ray Freeman. So here, for example, is the performance of the 180 degree X pulse. And it's of course terrible. Now I show you the frequencies going both positive and negative, the pulse has a symmetric effect. And then here's what's called a very popular, what's called the composite pulse, where there's a sandwich of First, a 90 degree X pulse, then a 180 degree Y pulse, and then a 90 degree X pulse. And you can see that the center band is now quite a bit broader. So, over some larger range, you get closer to ideal inversion. And you'll still see this pulse combination in pulse sequences, even though um, there are perhaps better optimal control or adiabatic pulses, this has the advantage of being relatively short. And then once you play the game, of course, you can try to optimize things more. So here is the center pulse being lengthened somewhat to 225 degrees. And that comes from doing a kind of perturbation theory. Um, but now you can see actually in the center band, the performance is pretty close to ideal. Of course, as you go off resonance, you get some really terrible behavior. Here, for the plane 180, the performance here isn't so good, as we said, but you get these nice clean nulls that are sometimes useful. Life is more complicated here. Here it is making the center band even longer. And you'll see both of these pulses in the literature. We, of course, could plot both what happens with offset, but also B1 in homogeneity, the amplitude of the pulse not being exactly what you think it is, because, of course, there's B1 in homogeneity during, due to the coil. So here is a simple 180, and then here's plot for some of these profiles. Here's one, a four pulse sandwich that has nice behavior, but you don't see that used very much. And why not? It starts to get long and these calculations are all done assuming there's no relaxation during the pulses, but if the 180 degree pulses say 20 microseconds, then we have 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 microseconds and relaxation effects start to be start to degrade what looks to be this very nice performance. 
as I said, now things are done by computer simulation. So these are just two popular pulses that came out of computer simulations, essentially where one has an expansion of a pulse shape in some kind of sine or cosine functions and then try to optimize performance. So there's a whole family of snob pulses, a whole family of rebirth pulses. And if you look on the Brooker spectrometer under something called shape tool, you'll see enormous families of pulses that these days were designed by computer simulation to try to get better and better performance. And there's not really any free lunch. So there is always a trade off between how well the pulse performs, how long it is, how subject it is to relaxation losses as the pulses get long. Yep. Uh, what do you mean by pulse shape? What is the y axis? Ah, so this, these, uh, these have the pulse shape is the amplitude of the pulse. So these pulses back here. These were constant amplitude. We're just changing the phase. And so we turn on with some constant omega-1 field for an effective 90 degree rotation, then change the phase, the effective length of twice that length, and then change the phase back to the original pulse length, where the length is adjusted to give us nominal 90 degree rotations. Here now, the amplitude is changed in this way. So when we, we start the pulse, there's very low amplitude omega one. And then you have this funny profile that came out of the calculation. And here's the full length of the pulse in just going from zero to one. And of course we have to adjust using the tools on the spectrometer, how long your pulse is really and what the maximum amplitude but that's all coded now on the, on the spectrometer. These happen to both be amplitude modulated pulses. So I just have to show you here the amplitude of the B1 field. But there also are phase modulated pulses in which I would have to show you both the amplitude and the phase of the pulse. I don't want to worry about this. I guess we'll have enough time. So just to give an example of the types of things that you can do, here is an arbitrary X-phase pulse. We don't have to worry about rotating the phase. So our five rotations turned into three rotations. So we have to rotate the effective field to the Z axis, rotate around Z, and then rotate back. So let's imagine that we're fairly close to resonance. If, we're, if we were on resonance, this is an X pulse, the tilting will would have put the magnetization, the effect, the effective field right into the transverse plane. And we would need a pi over two rotation to bring it back to Z. And the rotation angle would be just a little bit larger than pi over two. So the second line, for example, here, I've said that the rotation around Y is a little less than pi over two. I have to rotate by negative pi over two, and then the correction is it's positive because the net is really a little less than pi over two. And here the rotation around Z is going to be a little larger than pi over two because the effective rotation alpha is always larger than pi over two. So my tilt angle theta could have written it, I've written it down here. So the tilt angle is pi over two minus zeta. 
and the rotation angle is pi over two plus that, um, epsilon, because I've the field is tilted up a little bit as I go off resonance and the rotation angle is larger than pi over two. But if this is true, then these very small angles I can treat as commuting. So I can, of course, always commute y with y. And over here, uh, pi, a minus pi over two rotation applied to this little root to the z axis puts things on the x axis. And then this rotation of y puts this z axis on the x axis. So I've done the two pi over two rotations acting on the, z, on the two z axis. And that gave me this. The pi over two rotation acting on the y axis moves the y axis to the z axis. So that's here. And then the key thing is that these three small rotations commute with each other. So I've applied the Cartesian rotation to each axis. And now I want to commute all of the small rotations. When I get done commuting in small rotations, then because I know what it is I want to eventually uh, shuffle all the small rotations to one side, and I end up with a result where I have two Z rotations surrounding an X rotation. So what does this mean if I apply this sandwich? I'm gonna get a rotation around Z by Zeta, and then a rotation around X by Alpha, and then a rotation around Z by Zeta again. So if I'm not too, far off resonance, I end up with the result that the real pulse looks a little bit like a small Z rotation, followed by an X rotation, followed by a small Z rotation. And I can always think of a Z rotation, an angle, as being a frequency times a time. And this is due to resonance offset. This was all due to resonance offset. So it's convenient to think of this angle as being my resonance offset times some time. So then I can think of a 90 degree pulse off resonance as being an initial Z rotation precession by a time tau core an ideal X rotation, and then another rotation by tau core. And then I can fiddle around with the arithmetic and figure out the tau core looks like twice the length of a 90 degree pulse divided by pi. And you'll see this correction then in a lot of pulse sequences. If we're just doing a one pulse experiment, we don't care. We can rotate the magnetization of the transverse plane and then phase correct later. But if you have a pulse same, suppose you have a pulse sandwich, we have just take a cozy, we have a 90 degree pulse, a time delay, and another 90 degree pulse. Well, it, we recognize that that really looks like a Z rotation our pulse, another Z rotation, then our time delay, and then another pulse. That other pulse also looks like a little tau core, pulse tau core. Then we can adjust the time in the middle 
to account for the evolution during the pulses. Maybe I should show that. Nice if there was a, this was a little more transparent when I didn't switch. So if I'm just doing a 90 degree pulse applied to Z magnetization, this looks like a little rotation around Z by tau core. A pulse alpha around X, but alpha is just a little bit different than 90 degrees. So that's not going to be too heavy. Followed by another little tau core where magnetization can process around the Z axis. If this was the only experiment and I start acquiring the fin, that's just going to lead to a frequency dependent phaser that I then correct on the spectrometer. But if I have two pulses, now suppose I have, say, a pose, and I want to get pure phase here, then this really looks like tau core, the pulse by alpha, tau core, my delay T1, and then another tau core, pulse alpha, another tau core. And to get pure phase then, Whatever I thought my T1, what I wanted my T1 to be, I should really set it to be the T1 desired, T1 desired minus two times tau four to adjust for the fact that there's going to be a little bit of phase evolution during, during the pulse. And tau core indicated there is two times the pulse length pi, or I need to shorten this delay by four times the pulse length of pi. And when you look in a modern pulse sequence, it's littered with these calculations. Virtually every 90 degree pulse is going to be the delay following it will be compensated by this small correction in order that we keep something close to pure phase all the way through the spectrum. When then there's Forsher realized it. They basically were able to write a whole paper explaining how you could do this correction because a first order phase has its own its own set of difficulties that arise, particularly if lines have different line widths in the spectrum. So getting pure phase, particularly in experiments like a nosy spectrum, where you're trying to quantify very small peaks, very, any phase error in the spectrum becomes um, very difficult in identifying the weakest peaks. So one goes to a great deal of difficulty to get as pure a phase as possible in nosy spectrum. 
not so important, perhaps, in some other spectrum. It certainly knows this. Anyhow, that's meant to drive home the notion of the difference between commuting rotations because they're infinitesimal and non commuting uh, rotations and actually lead to something that looks like a yield a useful result in those correction factor for 90 degree space. Okay, so now we have all the tools to look at what happens in a one pulse experiment. So again, we're going to apply a pulse of some rotation angle and some phase. And this will be the kind of notation we'll use. A black bar will generally be just turn on the RF for some time period and turn it off. It will be adjusted to give on resonance some rotation angle that variously we might call alpha or beta. And then we'll have some phase, x, y, or some arbitrary phase. And then after the pulse, the receiver is turned on to record the processing magnetization in the transverse plane. And that magnetization will decay away eventually due to T2, at which point we can stop acquisition. So here's the picture. We start with equilibrium magnetization. In my picture, the phase was Y phase and perfect 90 degree pulse. The magnetization ends up on the plus x axis. The pulse after the pulse, the magnetization starts to process around the z axis. We measure the free induction decay and then Fourier transform in order to get the absorption spectrum. Now, in reality, of course, the processing magnetization has an x component and a y component. So spectrometers are designed to look like you record both the X component and the Y component. Uh, a modern console, the Rooker Neo console, you actually are just recording one component, um, but then the data is initially processed unbeknownst to you to make it look like you've acquired both X and Y components. That's because, as you'll see, that's very convenient mathematically to think of things as having an X and Y component because then you combine them to be a complex number. But in the old days, before digitizers were very fast, we actually had to have a scheme for recording what seemed to be X and Y mechanization. It's a detail we may talk about later when we talk about spectrum, how a spectrometer actually works. But for right now, we can imagine that we're going to be looking magnetization processing in the transverse plane, and we record the X magnetization and the Y magnetization, and they're 90 degrees out of phase with respect to each other. They then will be combined as I said, to give a complex number. So the X magnetization becomes the real part of the complex signal. The Y magnetization becomes the imaginary part of the complex signal. And then the Fourier transform of this gives the real part of the signal, which is called the absorption spectrum, and the imaginary part gives what's called the dispersive signal. So the Fourier transform would be nu of omega plus i times u of omega. In reality, because of these time delays, the spectrum that you record might be a mixture of the two. And then we apply phase correction, of course, to try to separate look at pure phase absorption spectrum. Or you can always play the game of adjusting delays to get a pure phase spectrum. And again, on a modern spectrometer, 
people don't spend as much time fiddling around with that as we used to because the base corrections tend to be very good. So mathematically, so anyhow, here's the mathematical form of the absorption spectrum, mathematical form of the dispersive spectrum. You can see why we prefer the absorption spectrum to look at relative to the dispersive spectrum. And what here, importantly, you can of course see we measure the frequency offset omega. And the line width then is determined by R2. The larger R2, the wider the line in angular units. The full width and half height, if you work out the mathematics here, the full width and half height is two times R2. And if you switch to Hertz, which is what we normally see on the spectrometer, you divide by two pi. So the full width and half height is R2 over pi. And of course, a huge amount of NMR depends on how, how large R2 is, because the frequencies all tend to be in a relative, in a fixed band, as you saw from the first slide. So the more resonances and the broader they are, the less resolution there is in our spectrum, making it most difficult. Mathematically, this looks like this. We have a, rot, a Y rotation as a 90 degree rotation. Afterwards, depending on the flip angle, we have some X magnetization, and some Z magnetization. The Z magnetization now is going to contribute because it's not processing. So we don't see it in the free induction decay. If we had exactly a 90 degree pulse, of course, we end up with only a X magnetization. The magnetization evolves under free precession and is damping, damping away due to, due to relaxation. We can combine this to make the complex signal. And here's a complex exponential, e to the i omega t minus r2. This comes from Euler's relation the e to the i theta, where i is the square root of minus one, is cosine theta plus i times sine theta. And we'll switch back and forth a lot between the Cartesian representation and this complex magnetization representation. So we'll get used to very much e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. The way a spectrometer is built, the detected signal is conventionally taken to be n plus the sum of the real part and the imaginary part. There's, of course, m minus, that would be the difference. That signal is there, but the way the spectrometer is built, we don't detect it. It's sort of arbitrary. Spectrometers could be built the other way. Um, but it's the convention rule of that. And the signal is n plus, and then we Fourier transform it. So the Fourier transform takes the signal, the complex signal, multiplies it by another complex exponential. And we integrate out the time to be left with a function of frequency. And then if we do the integral for S Mathematica to do the integral again, we get the absorptive part and the dispersive part. And if we do this for ubiquitin, again, we get the one pulse experiment showing proton dispersion. So what else can we do in our block equations? So we can do a one pulse experiment. We can also then do an inversion recovery experiment. So now 180 degree pulse is applied, followed by a delay key, 
And if there's 108, ideal 180 degree pulse, there's no transverse magnetization, so there's no precession during T. All that will happen is recovery towards Boltzmann equilibrium. And then we can see how much Z magnetization we have by applying a 90 degree pulse to put the Z magnetization in the transverse plane and then measure the free induction activity. So conventionally, this kind of pulse would be called a read pulse. We did something to the magnetization, but we can't detect directly what we did. We have to convert it to transverse magnetization in order to record the spectrum. So the read pulse converts whatever the state of the magnetization is into a state that we can record. So here we started with Z magnetization. The K is meant to be a unit vector on Z. After 180 degree X pulse, that will now be minus Z magnetization on K. Of course, you know that pulse isn't going to be perfect. It's going to generate some transverse magnetization. And in a real experiment, something we'll come to later, we would do something like change the phase of these pulses and add up signals in such a way that we can cancel the unwanted transverse magnetization. And I'm ignoring that for right now. During T, our, the magnetization is going to relax back towards Boltzmann equilibrium. So here's the equation. You can see if T is equal to zero, we get minus omega naught. And if T goes to infinity, we get plus omega naught. So the magnetization will evolve from the inverted state back to Boltzmann equilibrium. A 90 degree pulse turns this into minus Y magnetization. If we record the signal now, the free induction decay, it actually would look like a signal that was dispersive mode if we thought our detector was on X, but then we would just apply a magnetic phase correction after the fact. And we expect then to see magnetization that starts out upside down and then recovers back towards Boltzmann equilibrium. So here's data for ubiquitin. At time zero, the magnetization is upside down. After a while, you can see you can see that the different spins have different T1s because here these spins have all flipped, whereas these spins are still upside down. And I just picked one, this one here, and I measured the intensity as a function of time. There are some data points from different spectra, and then fit with that equation, they get a T1 time of about 0.9 reciprocal seconds, or T1 is a little longer than a second. The value of T1 turns out to be important because if I need to signal average, I have to wait at least that long before doing the next experiment. Otherwise, there's not very much Z magnetization to start the next experiment. In an ideal world, we would wait until Boltzmann magnetization completely recovered. But that takes something on order five T1s because of the exponential recovery. And usually you don't want to wait that long. We don't want to wait five seconds in between the scans. So while we tend to pretend that we recover to Boltzmann equilibrium before starting the next experiment, that's usually not true. Usually you're waiting one or two T1s to get a significant amount of magnetization back. One can, of course, try to calculate some optimal time. Given that I want to acquire as fast as possible, so I'm acquiring more scans and adding up signal, but I'm not recovering to Boltzmann equilibrium, what's the optimal time I should wait? And that's known, for example, for 1D experiments. And now there's a whole family of 2 and 3D experiments where people try to optimize this kind of approach and will eventually come to that. 
Yeah. Right. In principle, there's nothing being done here that should change in the line shape. So then it shouldn't matter whether I integrate the peak or to take the peak time. Obviously, here I picked one that's well resolved and I don't have any problems doing either. When the peak, when the spectrum gets congested, right, this simple 1D experiment, I really want accurate T1s. I can't do a 1D experiment, I have to do a 2D experiment. Most of, um, most of the time when we're measuring relaxation rates, we do something kind of intermediate between intensities and volumes. We add up some of the points near the top of the peak. So we're not looking at one point, but we're not trying to integrate down into the noise. Whereas nosies, you pretty much have to integrate the peak as best you can. So it kind of depends on application. You can ask that question again when we get to real spectra. So that's actually you know, very important to practice. The other experiment we could do in a block picture would be a spin echo. So now we have a 90 degree pulse to produce transverse magnetization. The magnetization is going to evolve for a while. Then we'll apply 180 degree pulse, let the magnetization evolve, and then turn on the receiver. And we can see what happens. So the first pulse generates minus Y magnetization. The magnetization processes around the Z axis with our right hand rule and decays away with R2. The 180 degree pulse around Y doesn't affect the Y magnetization, but the X magnetization rotates from plus X to minus X with the right, my right hand rule that I've now erased over here. And then during the second T2, one has to evolve the X magnetization. It processes from, positive, from negative X um, towards negative Y. And the Y magnetization processes from minus Y towards plus X. And again, I can keep track of all these signs by checking the rotations with my right hand rule. Otherwise, I make lots of sign errors, but that's for students to fix. And then we just apply some trigonometry or have Mathematica apply some trigonometry. If you're an NMR spectroscopist, you get very used to the sum and product rules for sines and cosines, making your high school trigonometry teacher very happy. And we see at the end, there's been no effective precession. We just have the gate decay during T2. This experiment is probably the most famous experiment in all of NMR spectroscopy. The spin echo discovered by Erwin Hahn, who was a graduate student. At first, he thought it was a, a mistake, a glitch in his spectrometer, which of course was home built in those days. And it was only later that he realized it was a real effect. And here you can see that we've separated the effect of chemical shift evolution from the effect of relaxation. We're looking only at the effect of relaxation. And almost all of modern NMR involves manipulating the spins with pulses and delays so that we can separate one kind of interaction from another and look at rather than looking at the full complicated everything that can possibly happen simplify the results to where they're interpreted. And again, we do the experiment changing T and map out T2. Here is, again, what we expect to see. When T is short, we should see the full transverse signal and it should decay away to zero. Here, I just took two time points for the amide region of ubiquitin. I didn't try to separate any individual peaks. I just kind of looked at average intensity change 
and uh, a rough measure of R2 of nine per second or a T2 of about 100 milliseconds for the aim height. In ubiquity. So we'll stop here. For isolated spins, we're done. This describes everything for isolated spins, but we're not so interested in isolated spins. For example, in solution, we're very interested in the effects of the scalar couplings. And we're interested in the nosy interaction between spins. In solid state, we're very interested in the dipole coupling between spins. So we need a treatment that can handle scalar couplings, dipole couplings, arbitrary interactions between spins. And we also have to do more than say there is a count, there is a resonance offset. We'd like to know more about where the resonance offset comes from, what chemical shift how chemical shift depends on molecular parameters. So we'll start now going forward. What are the actual physical basis for scalar couplings, chemical shifts, but also simultaneously working on a theory that helps us understand the evolution of the spin states under these other, other kinds of interactions. And then we'll try to cast it all back into something that looks like the block equations because the block equations are easy for us to understand. Two by two matrices, three by three matrices, that's about the limit of human understanding. After that, it's computers. Okay, so hopefully by tomorrow, we'll sort out the Dropbox problem and you'll be able to get access to the Dropbox, go over the, the PowerPoint and start to look at the first problems. See you on next Wednesday. Don't hesitate to email me questions as you start to look at the PowerPoint. Email anytime. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone who's online. See you next time. <laughs>